uh, we're going to be talking about uh, enhancing public transport as, as part of this session. Uh, we've got a great panel for us uh, today. Uh, it's the penultimate one. We've had some really good attendance today and some uh, amazing uh, feedback and comments. And we really will hope you will continue that uh, with us today. Um, we've got uh, uh, no um, uh, uh, subtitles or, or comments coming through, uh, unfortunately, due to the um, Zoom uh, 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 having problems with Zoom and how it's been interfering with the software. But but please put any of your comments that you've got in the chat uh, function, which will be really helpful. We want to capture everything we can as part of the consultation. And if you want to ask uh, a question, um, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can, uh, if you could put those in the question and answer function, uh, that would be really, really helpful. Um, let me just introduce our panel because we've, as I say, we've got a great panel with us today. We'll have a brief overview on the uh, transport strategy uh, from Paul Foster, who's the transport Str strategy manager for um, Lee City Council. And then we'll move on to councillor Kim Groves. She's a councillor for Middleton Park Ward, but she's a, importantly chair of the um, West Yorkshire Combined Authority Transport Committee. Um, we're, we've also got with us today Dave Pearson, who's the Director of Transport and Property Services at the Combined Authority, um, and he'll be talking about um, the work that's been done uh, over a number of years now on the on the bus strategy uh, uh, and also the bus partnership. Uh, and uh, alongside him, we'll have Martin Hurst from First Group, who's the Commercial Director for West Yorkshire and York, who's been a key member along with other operators as part of that uh, bus, bus partnership, uh, Bus Alliance. And then we'll hear finally from Simon, Simon Pope uh, from WSP, who is the uh, technical director leading on the uh, Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme and all the works that we've been seeing around the city centre, uh, mainly, and some of the approach routes uh, into the city. Uh, to improve uh, not just public transport, but also access to public transport and walking and cycling around, around the city centre. So if you can use, the, as I say, the chat function for, for comments, we'll welcome those and we'll record those. And if you can use the Q&A, uh, we'll get going and I'll hand over to, uh, I think, Paul Foster first, just to give us the, some background on where we've got to with the transport strategy. Okay, thank you, Nigel. So we've um, developed this transport strategy, which is out as a draft at the moment for consultation. And those of you who've um, registered for this have probably seen the website and hopefully are all going to engage in the, uh, the consultation on that and give us your comments. And that's really important for us. So we've set ourselves a vision for Leeds to be a city where you don't need a car. And that's very much about making sure everyone has an affordable, healthy, zero carbon alternative for every journey they make across the city. And I, I really want to stress that everyone and every journey. So within the strategy, we've set out a broad range of uh, solutions that we need to transition from where we are now to meet the aspirations that we've got in the city for tackling climate change, for delivering inclusive growth and improving health and well-being. Transport makes up a third of all carbon emissions in the city. Um, and so really there's got to be a focus on reducing the amount of internal combustion engines we're using in the fleet of vehicles that we have to get that carbon uh, reduction down. Uh, in terms of delivering inclusive growth, the, the, the whole essence of this strategy is to make a more efficient transport system, uh, which gives everyone access to the education, to the employment, to the leisure, to healthcare opportunities that exist in the city, and make sure that, that they, they feature for everyone, uh, wherever they're from, uh, whatever age they are, uh, those with disabilities, et cetera, to make it, make it fair and work for all. The other point around a tra an efficient transport system is that it, uh, should cost less for each individual for their transport. So we want to bring down the cost of transport uh, for everyone. In terms of improving health and well-being, through active travel, through walking and cycling, there are health and mental health benefit, physical and mental health benefits that people will get from that. But also we need to reduce the negative effects that transport have on our health in terms of reducing air pollution and uh, eliminating road danger from uh, the city. 
So we've set ourselves a number of uh, very challenging targets. And most, per most pertinent for today is probably that those increases in both bus and rail travel, um, 130% uh, bus and 100% rail. Now they're really challenging and, and I think hopefully what you'll get from the range of presentations we've got to do today is the essence of how we can get there the elements that we need to do both from the council in terms of delivering infrastructure from the combined authority in terms of their input into uh, how services are run and from the bus operators and, and, and rail operators about how they can deliver as well for us to, to reach those uh, targets okay next slide then so we've done a series of webinars and, and i'm not going to go into each of these for the time but there's the six areas of focus for us uh, mm -hmm. or we've called them big moves in the strategy and today's is very much about enhancing public transport and we really want to uh, focus on that one and as i said it's about it's about getting what we've, we've so often described as a virtuous circle with this we need to um get more people using it how do you do that so can we reduce the delay, increase the frequency, reduce fares, um, serve areas that we currently don't serve? So it's how can we build those positive things that get more people on, reinvest that uh, income from, from more people in to do more of those positive things and get a positive upturn in bus use that we haven't seen in, this, in the city. We've seen signs of it recently with the investment that we had. Um, but then obviously we've had COVID. So there'll be a bit more on that from everyone. But I think that's the real focus we need to, we need to uh, understand from today's presentation. Thank you. Came over to, to you. Um, that's OK. Thank you, Nigel. And I'm to be here today the transport strategy um, for Leeds and the vision that Leeds have set out is exciting, it's ambitious and it's absolutely the right thing to do. I'm under no illusion that actually we will need financial support but the city of Leeds is one of the cities that everybody talks about you know being a major city in the north if need, not the capital of the north so it's really important that the transport system um, is there for people. Alongside um, the Leeds vision, um, we work collectively together um, with West Shosh uh, Combined Authority, and we're setting out a clear vision for the future of transport in West Yorkshire and its role su for supporting our ambitions for our region in terms of improving standards of living and tackling the climate emergency that Paul has just uh, referred to. We have done some detailed work to understand how and where people live, work and access services. In the coming years, and um, we need to commit, connect communities and we need to connect them better than we do now. So our vision has been based on how we improve the bus offer and services right across West Yorkshire. So what does our real vision look like? How does that connect? And how will it connect to active travel and mass transit as we shape the places where people live and work. And so I'm really pleased to be here today and I really want to listen to your views and answer your questions, but really supportive of the vision that Leeds have set out. I'm gonna hand over to Dave Pearson, who is the Director of Transport at West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And Dave's going to present the work that we've been doing around bus. Thank you, Dave. On mute, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Only the third time today. Um, right. Yeah. Apologies for that. Um, I, I'm going to talk you through where we are with 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 the bus strategy and and the current situation with buses. Um, uh, happy to to have further sort of discussions in the question and answer about rail and the other aspects of public transport in the, in the city as well but we'll we'll focus on on bus for for the start um if you can just move to the next slide finn um uh, I'm, I'm going to take intentionally take a west yorkshire perspective on this um obviously as a combined authority we, we look across west yorkshire um and then we can sort of drill into it into some sort of specific things around leads um 
but but bus use in in our region is about average for for the the type of, of area perhaps perhaps a little lower um but then we we're quite rural in west yorkshire as well so um so bus use is sort of what you would expect to to have it in a regional conurbation um and we we set targets to increase bus use um by 25 percent in um, in the 10 years from from 2017 so um we um we we've we've got some big ambitions uh for the bus network um uh, and uh, one of the things we are very mindful of is you know buses and uh, and heavy rail are our public transport network in in west yorkshire and and that's uh, it's important that we, we we support both in terms of how they help people get around um the uh, the bus service is 85 percent run by commercial operators Areva, First and Transdev are the largest and there are several other smaller independent operators as well. Um, so that they operate them as businesses. Um, and so Martin, who will follow me, will we'll talk about the first perspective. But, but bus services are provided by, 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 uh, by companies on a commercial basis. The other 15% of the, the bus network is provided um, is, and subsidised by the, the taxpayer and operators under contract with the combined authority. So the combined authority um, which uh, which uses the trade name Metro for, for public transport use is the statutory local transport authority for the region. Um, so the combined authority has powers to uh, commission bus services, operate bus stations, um, passenger facilities. We, we coordinate travel information and we run concessionary fare schemes. Um, in our region, we're, we're fortunate to have one of the largest smart ticketing schemes outside London uh, with the M card. Um, and the M card is jointly owned by uh, the bus operators, the train operators, and the combined authority, and we manage that with a joint venture company. Um, so there's no public money directly subsidising the M card. Um, in the the, the M card is sold to customers, and we distribute the the sales re revenue to to pay for the transport that that people use. And I thought it's just useful just to to encapsulate in very very simple terms how buses are funded in our region. Um, so 60% of the costs are met by fares, 30% um, of the costs are met by the local taxpayers through concessions, through our contracted services. Um, so, so, so local taxpayers are paying roughly 30% uh, of the cost and another 5% of the cost are made by, is, is, is supported by national taxpayers through government grant. And then there's a 5% profit on average across across all of West Yorkshire, across all the companies. So that just gives you a bit of a flavour of the mix of commercial and and, um, and and public money in in the, in the network. Next slide, Finn. Um, we set a bus strategy in 2017, um, which which just was uh, I'll pick up some some keywords in that rather than read it out. Um, we, we want to put customers first because I think essentially if we're going to grow bus patronage, we've got to provide a service that people actually want to use. Um, it, buses are there to support economic growth. Um, there to 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 support our environmental aspirations as well. Um, and and to support local community and help people actually get around and, and get to the uh, and, and get to the uh, the health services education employment etc that they need to do so it, it, we we very much wanted a strategy which is about customers but also about you know it wasn't a strategy for buses as an end in themselves but actually what buses enable people to do so if you move to the next slide finn i just wanted to explain our approach to doing that and to, to delivering our strategy and in particular to, to how we work with bus operators because I think it's, it's really important to, to reflect that you know, we, the, the, the combined authority or the council can't do this on its own. Um, it has to do it alongside business, uh, alongside the, the bus operators that are, that are businesses that provide the services. And we've set up a, a, a what we call the bus alliance, which is a way of, of, of sitting down uh, with Martin uh, is on this call today and his colleagues at the bus operators um, to, to work together and to collaborate to to, um, to to look at how we can work together to, to actually improve the service for, for the bus passenger. Um, and in particular, we, we've focused very much on on how we can make buses appeal to young people. Um, and we, we've agreed an arrangement, uh, a fair deal arrangement for young people under 19. Um, and we've, uh, we're, we're looking at a number of different activities to, uh, to support how 
we can improve bus services. We're investing a lot in, in bus, bus infrastructure. I'm not going to touch on, on this too much because Simon's coming along to, to tell us a lot of the work that Simon uh, and, uh, and Paul and, uh, and his colleagues have been doing in, in Leeds to, uh, to invest in buses. But it's not just heavy infrastructure. Um, we're, we're, we're going to launch a new demand responsive transport service in the city um, where we've started and I'll show you a picture in a second of, uh, of a new way of actually presenting the bus network to customers um, and so we're doing a mix of, 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 um, of work to, to support bus and what I would say in terms of infra infrastructure and I, I've already seen a few comments on the chat and, and questions and answers in, in the question and answer piece. Um, Punctuality, reliability of our services is absolutely key. That's the most important thing to customers. We know this. Um, and, and bus companies like First know this too. Um, and we really do need to manage the road and to provide a reliable road network for that buses can, can operate on as well. And I think that's really key to, to providing a bus service people want to use. People need to be have confidence in it. And we need, we need to address the highway network as well as the bus service provision in, in doing that. This sits alongside our connectivity infrastructure plan, and some of you be aware we're consulting people on that at the moment, um, and we'd absolutely see a role for bus alongside mass transit uh, in terms of providing the, uh, the network of, of public transport that people need to get around our region, and we're very much conscious of the fact that um, buses can be um, beneficial in terms of improving air quality. Uh, we've already spent a lot of money in upgrading the, the uh, bus exhaust emissions in our region. Um, the, uh, I'm sure uh, Martin will, will tell us about the electric buses that first have already operated and are about to operate on Park and Ride as well. Um, and we've worked with, with bus operators on on what we call a, a roadmap, a, a strategy as to how we can get um, investment into to low carbon buses. So if we go to the next slide, Finn, um, just wanted to show you a couple of pictures, we won't dwell on this too much. Um, on the left-hand side is our new Leeds Core bus network map um, and the city centre map. And um, this is trying to bring in a, a colour-coded London underground tube style approach so that particularly people who are not familiar with how to catch the bus, can, can find their way around the city by bus. And the, the challenge we sort of set ourselves was if somebody arrives at Leeds Station by train and has to go to an appointment at St. James's Hospital by uh, and catch the bus from the station to the hospital, how do they do that? Because it's actually really quite difficult at the moment. We want to, we want to address those um, wayfinding and, and, um, and the, the way in which people who don't know how to use the bus uh, can use the bus. And that's what that's aimed at. Um, I'll pick out a couple of other things on that, pick, uh, on that sort of montage as well. Um, top right, um, we've introduced in response to COVID um, into, a, into the real time information displays uh, an occupancy level so that people can see how bus, how full the bus that's approaching their stop is um, and I think we're one of the first areas in the country to do that um, and that sort of is going to reflect on what I'm about to say around the impacts on COVID and, and finally bottom right um, again to to reflect where people are going to want to want the bus network to be um, in the, the sort of uh, the, the, the world after COVID um, very conscious of the fact that some people are not going to go to their workplaces a full five days a week and therefore not going to want to buy weekly and monthly season tickets and end cards as they have done in the past. Um, and so we, along with the bus operators, uh, are looking at more flexible ticketing arrangements and we're, we've already launched the end card mobile app, uh, which enables people to do that. Um, and we'll give that lots of promotion along with lots of other things that, that we've been doing that's on this picture um, through the summer just to uh, to illustrate what, uh, what what's coming. So if we've got the next slide, please, Finn. Um, the pandemic has really had a massive effect on public transport. Um, and that massive effect is that essentially, as we speak, um, just over 30% of, of the people who would normally use the bus are traveling around by bus at the moment. And that's that's been as low as 20% and 15% over the, the last year. Um, and that's a lot of revenue that isn't in the system. That's a lot of money that's not going through, flushing through the system. Um, and the bus services have been supported by a mixture of, of local taxpayers' money and national taxpayers' money to keep them going. Um, and so it, we, we have a financial 
issue around buses um, and what we do need to do is work together with the bus companies with national government uh, to to basically nurse the bus service back to a financial health um, as we come out of the pandemic um, but as we come out of the pandemic there are a number of realities which we're going to have to face in terms of managing the bus service um, as I mentioned earlier people's working and shopping habits have changed and that will change their travel habits and that will mean people may travel less often by public transport or they may make different journeys um, and we have to face the fact that bus patronage is not going to go back or rail patronage for that matter is not going to go back to the levels we saw in 2019 uh, very quickly um, and so all the, um, the forecasts that, uh, that various people made up down the country would suggest that uh, by next year we, we will only be around 80% of that so so that's a reality customers expectations of, of public transport are going to be different they're going to be more sensitive to hygiene they're going to be more sensitive to overcrowding we need to to factor that into our, our thinking as well um, and the financial in, impact on on buses is that the balance of commercial risk and, and public subsidy will change um, and that's something which we um, we we do need to to manage because there's a finite amount of money of taxpayers money available and so we, we've got to balance that commercial and, and public subsidy um, element very very carefully and in in, in the past week we've we've looked at very different approaches to doing that and uh, in a way we, we need a new creative way of doing that as well and we're, we're working through that with with the government and with bus operators and finally we can't lose sight of the um, the climate emergency and the fact that we we do need to move buses to, to be zero carbon. We need more zero carbon, whether it's electric hydrogen buses on our roads. Um, and that might involve more public sector intervention in, in terms of funding that. Um, and government actually this afternoon uh, were, was, were briefing us on some funding streams that might help with that. So um, so if we move to the, the last slide, please, Finn. Um, so what are we doing next? Um, We've, we've, we're sort of working together in something called a recovery partnership because I think that the emphasis is going to be between the, the, the magical date possibly of, of the 21st of June um, uh, for the rest of the financial year is, is basically doing that nursing the bus service back to a financial health, launching some of the things that, that Simon and others are going to talk to you about in a minute, um, uh, launching some of the new ticketing initiatives which we've got um, to, to basically get and encourage people back onto public transport. We're expecting in the next month or two uh, the government to issue its national bus strategy um, and one of the things government are going to ask us to do is to provide a bus improvement plan for the region and to submit that uh, by the autumn of this year and that will be our route to getting more government funding through for for buses in the future so we've got a big task on our hands over the summer and autumn to to both um, support and uh, financially support buses coming back but also to develop a plan for the future um, and then what, what we then going to do is, is take our bus alliance and move it into something called an enhanced partnership which is a it is is a statutory partnership which um which enables the combined authority and bus operators to, to jointly manage a bus network um and engage very closely with with the city council and other councils to to in, involve ourselves with transport focus and, and other passenger groups as well to to create a partnership approach so that we're all working together um to uh, to and, and sharing the financial risk and reward to delivering a good bus service and we do that in the in the context of in, a, in our connectivity infrastructure plan actually you know, it's a really big role for buses in the future of west yorkshire um alongside any further development in, in terms of other modes such as as mass transit so um we 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 will, we will be looking at the network because i think one of the things we do know is that once things settle down after after the pandemic then travel demands and and, and travel behaviors and practices are going to be different and we need a bus network that reflects the the, the changed environment that uh, that it's going to be after after the year uh, that we've just had so i'll stop there um, and hopefully that gives you a flavour of what our thinking is about bus, and I'm happy to, uh, to to address the question and answer at the end. Thanks, Nigel. That's great. Thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, Martin. 
I, yeah, I can see there's plenty of questions queuing up, so I won't uh, I won't add much to uh, what David said. And Dave did talk about the, the you know the economics of the uh, of the bus industry. He talked about five percent uh, profit. Um, it will it takes around about ten percent uh, profit to uh, maintain the same fleetage in terms of investment. So what that means is uh, there's certainly more there's more money coming into Leeds and West Yorkshire from from the bus company than there is there is coming out in that in that way. I mean, so I'll talk about our investment in new buses in particular, but that's before you even talk about electric vehicles. And Leeds and West Yorkshire aren't um, any different to a lot of ma other major areas where um, we're stuck in a, a slightly vicious cycle where uh, growing uh, congestion, um, which uh, without bus priority means that buses. Um, have to add extra time into the schedule, extra cost into the schedule, it increases the journey time, it uh, reduces reliability, um, and therefore um, that puts people off using it, which reduces the revenue uh, uh, alongside those uh, increasing costs. And then there's a choice either to, to, to remove services or put prices up, which is the, is the downward spiral. Now, David's talked about the partnership we've been uh, part of, and, and Simon will talk next about investment infrastructure and, and, and the way out of that is, is that package of being able to um, provide some priority for buses, uh, reduce those journey times, but more importantly, uh, narrow the uh, narrow the gap between the worst and the best time um, it takes to do a journey, uh, and that allows uh, uh, bus companies to 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 timetable things accurately. Um, it does mean that then that reduces the the extra costs that have been uh, added into uh, added into the timetable for that. I think I mean there's been many lessons from uh, from COVID. Um, Quite a bizarre one for a, a commercial bus company. Uh, certainly, me and my team have spent most of our time discouraging people using for our, our services for, for the best part of twelve months, which is, uh, um, a, you know, really strange, uh, really strange role. But I think on a positive note, it, what it has done is underlined uh, the vital role that, that buses uh, play in in the in the town and the, you know town, any town and city uh, economy. Um, the, you know, the funding that we received from government to make sure that we could continue running services to provide uh, journeys for uh, essential uh, key workers and, and other essential trips um, shows that. But I think the biggest lesson for me is how uh, more efficiently in terms of um, cost we've been able to run that. So, I mean, we've we've been fully funded by government for, to, to do that, carrying at the most around about uh, 50, 55 percent of our passengers and revenue. So without the government funding, we wouldn't have been running a service. But we've been challenged to do that as efficiently as possible. And without the car, some of the cars on the road, the reduction in that uh, congestion has meant that we can actually run. We've been certainly pre this lockdown, we we're running around about 100 percent of our previous mileage, but with around 85 percent of the, the staff and the bus hours. Uh, on, on you know on some services so somewhere between five and fifteen percent of our overall cost is tied up in adding time into the schedule uh, to uh, to make sure that we can uh, we can deliver as as near as possible uh, a punctual service which is really it, it really is waste and there's a bit that Sam will talk about in a minute uh, with 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 infrastructure schemes and and bus priority. Uh, unlocks all that and that then changes the economics that Dave talks about and that then can change the vicious cycle into a virtuous one where we can invest in increased frequency I think I've just seen a question pop up about increased frequency absolutely if you can start changing the economics of that you can um, you can uh, add frequency the punctuality and the route the reliability to go up uh, fares don't need to go up that will get more people on and then you're talking into uh, into into a virtuous uh, circle and I think you know we should um, we should recognise, uh, whilst we're nowhere near the, the ambitious growth targets we're talking about, where the schemes that have already started and underway uh, in and around Leeds and where we have um, already delivered our bus, our new bus investment. I mean, we've delivered around about 55 million of our promised 75 million uh, investment in, in new buses, um, where we've done that aligned with, with, with frequency. Uh, we ha we've actually we have seen growth, which is book massively booking on, uh, the national trend in a number of areas of Leeds. But we just need to do that in a much uh, yeah, in a much bigger way. So notwithstanding COVID, pre, pre that we were starting to see that uh, targeted schemes you know could deliver this, and uh, and 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 the things that are coming, the large scale schemes that are coming are only going to uh, are going to accelerate that. Um, I will leave it there and uh, hopefully uh, after Sam we'll get on to the uh, questions.
That's great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Simon, over to you. I think you've got some slides as well, haven't you? So yeah, cheers. Okay, so thanks, Nigel. Um, I've been asked to talk briefly around the role of infrastructure investment across the city, reflecting on some of the lessons learned from my involvement in the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. So what do we mean by infrastructure? Well, I think it's often quite an overused term to cover everything from concrete in the ground to digital solutions that might, say, improve a passenger experience or reduce the need to travel in the first place. The Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme alone represents over £200 million of investment in the city's infrastructure. And you can see that investment materialising now through the works underway across the city centre, along key corridors into the city, such as the routes in from Bradford and Wakefield, and at new and existing park and ride sites, where we're increasing capacity by over 2,000 spaces. Now, the three key things that we've learned from bringing that infrastructure to fruition over the past few years, which I think we need to reflect upon if we're going to be successful in the, um, when we plan the next round of infrastructure needed to support this transport strategy's goals. The first is the need to avoid focusing on infrastructure for a single mode of transport at the expense of all others. Whilst the Public Transport Investment Programme has been driven by an aim to improve the attractiveness of bus travel, the infrastructure being implemented on the ground, as you can see on the headrow, recognises the need to create a sense of place for different users and for different purposes. It's for that reason that many of the schemes you've seen being delivered across the city at the moment include extensive provision for pedestrians and cyclists, together with high quality public realm, where people may choose to dwell and spend time. Whilst the measures that benefit buses are clearly at the heart of the proposals, the schemes also try to avoid significant disbenefits to general traffic, given the need for some essential private journeys to take place. I'm sure we can all identify locations in all of our cities where less holistic solutions have been delivered in the past, often due to funding constraints, and Leeds is no exception to that. Um, what we find is that that can lead to trade-offs that alienate different road users and even result in suboptimal solutions being delivered for the mode that we're actually trying to design for if we're not able to justify the extent of the investment needed to try and deliver something better. The second learning is around involving the community. Delivery of infrastructure requires compromise. Ideally, infrastructure should embody a place and actually be something that we're proud of. Balancing often conflicting needs of different users requires us to fully understand the problems we're actually trying to solve and the aspirations of people that live near, use, or will ultimately be impacted by the infrastructure that we develop. Now, whilst it's not always possible to address everyone's concerns, we need to ensure we've found an equitable balance that provides the best compromise, meaning that we need to engage proactively with both stakeholders and the public as a fundamental part of the design process. We actually received over 100,000 contributions to our consultations on the Public Transport Investment Programme, which ensured the schemes that evolved effectively reflected local concerns and ultimately provided confidence to our elected officials that we were investing in the right things. It's unavoidable that transport is an emotive subject and one that quite rightfully warrants people's opinions being heard. I think those of us involved in developing infrastructure have a responsibility to try and communicate the evidence that's informing our decision making in a clear and transparent way. This is going to require us to demonstrate how and why we've weighed up wider strategic benefits, so that might be an improved bus journey time across a whole route, against localised disbenefits that may be unavoidable in certain locations, such as where we might need to remove parking or maybe restrict movements at a particular junction. The final lesson is around the need for us to continually evolve our thinking around what makes effective infrastructure, being ever mindful of what's coming next. Infrastructure alone cannot enable us to reach our net zero targets. What it can do is help provide attractive travel choices or even reduce the need to travel in the first place, but makes other policy measures and interventions that incentivize radical shifts in behavior more viable. I think it's fair to say we're currently in a period of unprecedented change driven by technology, the decarbonisation agenda and what COVID has shown us in terms of the pace at which transformation can happen. I think were we to design the public transport or redesign the public transport investment programme now in light of these developments, we might see an appetite to be even more ambitious in the schemes that we're currently delivering.
Despite post-COVID uncertainty that, that Martin and uh, Dave has touched on, we know that investment in infrastructure will continue to play a key part in our economic recovery and the levelling up agenda. But some of the drivers that inform what we build have changed. Economic growth should not come at the expense of the environment. If the carbon involved in building new infrastructure exceeds the carbon savings we stand to gain from more people travelling by public transport, would clearly we need to rethink our solutions to ensure infrastructure itself does not hinder our climate change targets. I think this understanding may in turn give our decision makers the confidence to become more radical in their thinking. And that's not about being anti-car, but it is about rebalancing how we reprioritize the use of space for public transport and in, indeed active modes more efficiently, reflecting on the objectives that the transport strategy sets out and the urgent need to act in light of the climate emergency. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Simon. That's really, really good. Um, so I'm going to go quickly to um, the question and answer because uh, we've got about sort of half an hour and we've got lots of questions. I'm pretty certain we will not get through all of them in the time available, but we will aim to get back to people where we can uh, on the questions they raise. And I'm going to try and group them into various types. So um, if we can get some quick punchy ans answers in from the panel i'll be very grateful um so let, let's start one that comes up regularly um in, in this and it, it, i'll go to you paul and to you councillor groves on this this one it, th these plans are not about the city center alone these are about Leeds as a district and as i think dave pearson framed they're in the wider context of west yorkshire um can, you know people have said you know how are we going to get solutions to weatherby or or to otley or to some of our outlying parts of the district councillor groves you're just on mute i think at the moment um, I think in terms of the wider plan, Reeds have led the way with the, um, they had the 173 million, they've made an excellent start in terms of connectivity, um, but we're looking at transformational change here and it's going to take time. I'm already seeing that starting to happen across Leeds, Bradford, Perkins, Calderdale and Wakefield, but it's about all those multi-modes coming together and it is about significant investment in transport and it is about reduction of carbon and it is about making that modal shift and behaviour change. Um, but yeah, I think we will be, we're looking at every area um, right across West Yorkshire. We hope that no community will be left behind, that the model is still in the making um, and, and I'll leave it there. That's great. Thanks, Councillor Grove. Um, um, Paul, we're absolutely certain this is about the, the city dis and districts of Leeds, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, I think if you look at the detail within the strategy, there are some measures around the city centre, but the majority of investment that we need across the city is, is in those in those urban and rural areas to make sure that um, you know those areas that are very much dominated by car dependence have got alternative options. And they're sometimes the hardest solutions to bring forward, but this strategy is setting out that there is a, a definite need to do that and to make it much better for the uh, for the, for those communities as well. Okay, that's great, Paul. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the things that's come up quite in a number of the questions, uh, and I'm going to address this to you, you Martin, and and you, Dave, is you touched upon it in your presentations as well. Your reliability, service delivery. Have we got confidence in the bus services? Seems to be, in my terminology, I think it's been used in the chat as well, you know, when services knock uh, and, and leaves people stranded. Are they there early in the mornings and late at, uh, at night? And how do we make sure they are there? What sort of network should we be developing? And how do we make sure that the coverage is right, uh, you know, for all of our communities? Martin, you know, David, what's your thoughts on that? Do you want to go, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I can start. I'm sure, I'm sure Martin's got a view as well. I, I, I mean, in terms of punctuality and reliability, then there are two basic parts to that. One, Martin and his colleagues need to be able to get all the buses out that they've got to run and the, uh, and and to have the and planned and organized and the buses and the drivers in the right place the second part of it is that we've got to have a, a road network that ideally and this is this is an ideal world um it 
provides a, a sort of stable environment for the buses to operate in. Um, and one of the challenges that we do have with bus operations and therefore people feeling that uh, the buses uh, are, are knocking or, or not running or running very late or, or whatever, is that um, if a bus leaves a depot at six o'clock in the morning um, and, and is significantly delayed um, between six and, and eight, then between eight and nine, it's, 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 it's running to catch up. So, so to a certain extent, we need to make sure that the highway network um, is, is reliable for the bus to operate. Um, and that's where the bus priority schemes and the infrastructure, infrastructure schemes come in. And they can be large and small. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean bus lanes everywhere. Bus lanes help in some re regards. Sometimes it's just making sure the traffic signals are um, adapted to uh, to enable the, the, the bus to get through. Sometimes it's about little pinch points of moving parking areas slightly so that buses can keep moving um, and, uh, and dealing with all of the factors that uh, can cause that disruption for, for buses to operate. So, yeah, there's, there's a there's a lot of collaboration needed and that's why we stress that's that sort of partnership approach because the bus operator alone can't guarantee a, 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 a reliable service uh, without us getting the highway right um, and without getting all of the other factors in, in the service right as well so um, and that's that's the key to it um, and fully understand that people's experiences are variable and that you know people will I've done it myself gone for a bus and it didn't turn up that happens um we need to make it happen less um and that's got to be something that between the bus operator the council and ourselves and the police and the enforcement for parking and all of the other factors need to actually work together to make that happen that's great Thank, thanks dave uh, martin you know you you you're responsible for the operational side you know what what do we do and and, and do we get those services really spot on yeah, I, I, Dave says it has to be in partnership, and you know our statistics stack up, stack up well with with other providers and, and and across the country. I'm not making excuses for for services that don't turn up, but I think Dave's outlined it really well. I mean, we measure um, everything that we do and try to to improve on it regularly. I mean, particularly our engineering. Uh, so you know, so where we a service misses for not you know having a bus breakdown is 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 one of the lowest is in the in the country. It's less than we, we lose less than a quarter of a percentage of our schedule mileage as a result of that. Uh, which is which is incredibly low. That's been, I mean, pre-COVID, that was down to under 0.2%. Um, you know, driver sickness is something that we've done a lot about and having enough spare drivers. You know, we get out around about 99.5% of the time we get out of the depot for that first journey, absolutely bang on time. And as Dave said, the problems sort of manifest themselves, um, uh, you know, later in the day. It, it, isn't, uh, it isn't easy to have lots of, uh, spare buses just on the on the you know the corner of streets where where things go wrong when you when you run such a wide network. So if something does go wrong um, and and get behind further out, um, then it's quite a long time to get something out there to to replace it. So it, we you know we work very hard at the stuff that is in our control, and we also work very hard with our with our partners to uh, try and address the areas that are causing us the most uh, difficulty. I mean that, that our ticket machines produce unbelievable amounts of data that can help people like. Um, Simon and Dave to, to, to point money, um, you know, where we need to be, as you said, where, whether it just be traffic lights or, you know, small um, interventions uh, to try and to deal with those hotspots. Okay. And you're, you're happy. I, I mean, you're happy to receive comments and feedback from, from your customers, you know, and where there are problems, have them identified, aren't you? I think that's absolutely, that's, absolutely. That's 100%. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, and can I just ask you a quick supplementary question, just while while you're 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 in the seat? Um, how green are the buses in Leeds? Not just first, but obviously Transdev and um, Arriva. How do they compare? Yeah, I mean Le Leeds has to have one of the cleanest fleets uh, uh, going. Uh, I mean we were um, well on the way for full compliance with the with, with the clean air zone. I mean there's been a lot of investment by all the operators. Um, I mean, Euro 6 diesel gets a, a bad rap probably because of car usage, but it's, I think it's something like five to six times cleaner than uh, than, than a Euro 5 uh, bus. Uh, I mean, the, the, the difference you get between changing from a Euro 6 diesel to an electric vehicle is, is, is quite is quite minimal, uh, you know, for the extra cost. I mean, obviously, we, we are, you know, moving to zero emission. We've, we've invested in nine 
um, single decker EVs um, and um, another uh, five uh, that have just been ordered for, for Sturton Park and Ride as well. And we'll we'll continue with that. Some of our colleagues in Scotland are trialing uh, hydrogen buses, so there'll be you know, the, the, the decision to be made there. But the, the, the fleet in uh, Leeds is is incredibly clean. And even pre-COVID, we were seeing the you know where we have the Euro Six diesels, you know, full complement of new buses on on major corridors. Um, we've had some studies from the University of Leeds, independent studies that show the uh, you know big a big difference in emissions. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Paul, I, I want to just come to you now about car ownership. I mean, you, you, I just want to really be clear because I think one of the questions is, uh, and not about using using car uh, and this being being against car use. I mean, you're, you're clear, you, you want to make sure that the strategy means you don't need to use a car or have to use a car, but it's not an anti-car strategy. Is that is that correct? And what, what are you doing about um, uh, car use uh, uh, and bus uh, and, and rail services in, in the outer areas where, where car use tends to be more, more, more commonplace, perhaps? Yeah, so I think it, it, it very much is, as you as you say, Nigel, this is about, you know, a need for a car. We What we're trying to do here is is give people alternatives that they can choose to use. The council can't make you do, um, you know, get rid of your car. The, the, the highway network will remain. People will be able to get to where they want. What we hope people will see and we can encourage is that greater use of alternatives because, as we've been talking about, the, the congestion that we experience on the road does make it you know in a city and an urban environment like Leeds there's not enough space for everyone to own a car and drive a car every day um, that's the reality of it uh, the most successful cities in the world have hugely good public transport systems uh, and people use them regularly and that reduces the congestion effect makes them much more economically vibrant and viable so i think we we need to look to move towards that system but it is about encouraging people giving people better alternatives um in terms of sort of that outline area as well i, I mean i think the, the the points i made around is investing in park and ride that's very much about how therefore do we connect people in more rural areas who rely on their car to access the city center in a different way so they don't have to drive in all the way pay the high parking fees they can utilize park and ride reduce the emission effects as they uh, pass on their journey into the city by using the park and ride and you know and, and we need to i think um, what maybe covid has shown a number of people is that um it's more efficient not to commute isn't it so that time that we are uh, we used to use driving is wasted time and and so the more people can use public transport and maybe see that as an option to be able to do other things on that, whether that's catch up with friends on social media, whether it's watch a, a, a movie that you want to watch or whether it's actually catch up with some work emails, et cetera, as, as digital technology has improved. So I think there's a, there's a point around actually what are the advantages of using public transport over the car as well. And hopefully a number of those factors will come into play and people will start to change for the, for the benefit of us of all. That's great. Thanks. Um, I, want, I want to go to you, Simon, actually, just to pick up on some of the points that you, you raised about priority measures in, in the city. And can you just sort of outline how you see those fitting together? It isn't just about, I mean, the LIPTIC programme is largely about the city centre and, and the main corridors leading into Leeds. But we've talked about hubs, we've talked about those in central Leeds, we've talked about them in the communities across the district. How, how do you see all that fitting together so we've got an integrated network? And it isn't just about, um, it isn't just about buses, but it's about what you've been doing about cycling and walking and integration with other modes such as car uh, and, and rail. I think it, it's been touched on by a few people really, but it's having predictability in journeys and people being able to plan their journeys and make the right travel choices that are for them based on the journeys that they need to undertake. So that picks up on what Dave alluded to earlier in terms of information and making sure people can understand the network. It means that when you turn up at a bus stop, you know that the bus is going to arrive when it says it's going to arrive. I think that's where the priority measures come in that give us the reliability and give us predictability in our journey times. Um, we need to make sure that we are integrating between different modes, so between walking and cycling for people who might be using those modes in order to access the bus service. But as I touched on in my presentation as well, you know, the bus 
takes up space within an urban environment that is a, it's effectively a place and that place needs to perform multiple functions. And I think we need to recognize that when we're designing that place to ensure that the needs of very, you know, diverse needs of different users are accommodated. And I think at the moment, a lot of our places are dominated by uh, vehicular traffic in the form of cars. And then we, I think we just need to try and readjust that balance so that we get a more equitable split in how we're using that precious space um, to give more uh, opportunities for other modes to capitalize on that and make those modes more attractive. That's great. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I think we haven't probably got to the bottom of the questions around services. So I'm just going to set up a few and I'm going to go to Councillor Groves and, uh, and Dave Pearson and Martin just to pick up these particular questions. And I think, um, you know, a, a fairly sort of quick answer from each of you would be, be really helpful, although I recognise it is complex. Um, but so a number of questions around early morning late at night services and how they fit together to provide people who you know particularly people who are working you know need to make sure that they can get to their place of work or get home from their place of work easily we've got a number of questions around uh, demand responsive you know uh, and also the city center shuttle bus you know you know what what are we doing about city center shuttle buses you know as the city center expands that came up in in the mass transit discussion as well um, and, and also um, you know how do we how do we see the role of of uh, of um, D DRT delivering some of the other solutions for our, our communities, particularly maybe some of these orbital services that a number of people have asked about that aren't, aren't on the trunk corridors. Um, Councillor Groves, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, in terms of DRT, it's been trialled up and down the country and it's still early days and there's not been any, ma any major success stories. I think Arriva Click has been the most successful um, in Liverpool. So I think we've got to get the model right for people of West Yorkshire. I've looked at community models, I've looked at community models that haven't quite worked for communities. So I don't want to set us up to fail in West Yorkshire. In terms of growing the network for those morning and, and, and late night services, that's definitely an ambition that we have. But again, it would be which modes do serve that and how we put the hub and spoke models around places to make that work and um, so connecting our rail stations our bus stations um, and the different modes together and eventually a tram system going back to in terms of reliability we've got to acknowledge that as a region we have to reduce car use by 88 percent to meet our targets if you take all those cars off the road you cut congestion which then means you've got a much more efficient and effective public transport system to get through and you, you're making that modal shift. In terms of our real vision, we've already highlighted and done work um, that makes sure that all communities would have a set service if we can get our real um, vision. It's not just about the big projects that we want right across the region, it, can, it, it, it should be about electrification of services as well um, on the rail. And, and what part that can play in terms of making those efficient services. About all those modes coming together to have an integrated transport system with a digital offer um, that's easily understood and affordable fares. That's great. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Dave? Yes. Um, I, I, to, to pick off a few of those, those points, I mean, first, demand responsive transport, for, for those who are not familiar with the term, it, it's, it's essentially usually a minibus. Uh, and you, you book it online um, and it comes and picks you up and, and, and takes you to, to where you've booked the journey to. So it's somewhere between a bus and a taxi. Um, it, we, we're going to introduce a new service in, in the east of Leeds uh, to, to, to trial that in the city. Um, and we've, uh, we've already commissioned some electric buses to do that. Um, and so we've, uh, and we hope to, to launch that in September. Um, but I would, what I would say is, as Council Girls has, has alluded to, um, these services are quite expensive to operate. So we need to be able to generate enough people to use them to be able to put them to pay their way. And I think that's that, that's one of the realities we, we, we do have to work with with this is that um, if we put some some new services on, um, we need to be confident that we'll get the levels of use um, and 
uh, that uh, that that'll support the, the costs of them because uh, essentially a, a demand responsive transport service is essentially a, a group of of minibuses running around an area uh, picking people up and dropping them off. So um, so we'll see how the East Leeds trial goes in terms of East Leeds early morning and, and, and late evening services. Um, well, again, you know we 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 do have uh, a service provision out there at the moment that, that starts early and finishes quite late. Um, we, as a city, we, we we never really got evening buses to work, uh, uh, sorry, and and, and um, overnight buses to work. Um, uh, and this is a city with a strong taxi culture as well um, for, for people who are travelling there tonight. So um, to a certain extent, we, we again, we, we've got to actually provide the services that people are going to use um, and keep our eye on that. But I think we're also very mindful that, um, that um, people's travel habits are going to change after the pandemic and, and, and to reflect that. Um, on the city centre shuttle, it's an interesting point. Um, we did used to have one, as, as some of you on the call will, will recall, um, and I'm sure Martin would um, would kick me under the virtual table if I didn't say that actually the service five is is the uh, it actually provides that ability for people to hop on and off uh, a bus around the city, uh, and that's the service that's now operating with electric buses. Yes, it probably needs to be a little bit more visible to people. I think we we all acknowledge that, um, and and perhaps that we do need to go further, maybe more into the South Bank in terms of of shuttle buses. So um, yeah, I think that's a that's a live issue that that we do need to uh, to pick up on. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Dave. M Martin, any. I think just to follow on from that, I mean, we did invest in nine electric vehicles for the for the for the five service. We did want to relaunch that. That was ju just all happened just pre-COVID. So coming back after that, there will be a relaunch of that. The element of that of the city bus. If anybody has been on one, there is the city bus, old city bus map relaunched on it. Uh, you can get on there with your um, your existing uh, you know day ticket. Your park and ride customers can connect that for, for free, um, and we'll be uh, adding back in the but the you know very short hop fare for people who um, uh, move around that. We've also talked to our colleagues at TPE as well, uh, Transpan Express, sorry, to, to to look at how we can have a um, you know a through ticket uh, jump on there. Uh, for example, connecting with the hospital from the train. So the number of things that we can do with that, and, and, and we will. I mean, you know, the city, uh, the city buses elsewhere we're talking about are you know are, are funded usually uh, and not and not commercial. I think just coming back to um, the DRT, I think that's that's got so that's that's um you know quite exciting to, to to look at how that goes as i said it's um you know different way of doing things i think we often get compared to the london model you know in london people are used to getting multi-leg journeys people don't necessarily like them but you, you know you do need more frequency but if there are ways to look at parts of the network that aren't really best served by buses winding around lots of estates i think i've seen some of that in the in the in the, in the questions if we if we can um, you know, maintain our focus on um, high frequency, you know, point to point down, uh, you know, down, down, down major corridors and have, uh, you know, other types of services that link those There's every chance that you can create something that means you can get to your destination from some of those places on a two legged journey quicker than you could on a current one legged journey. So that 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 I think is quite exciting how we re how we redesign that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that that's great, Martin, because you you you've you've led me into uh, another question, which is is um, across all of the uh, questions that we've been been um, receiving, and that is, um, how do we make them affordable? You know, what does affordable look like in fares? Uh, I think you're doing some work around uh, capping with some of the other operators and the and the combined authority, and and how do we make sure the value for money? I think when people weigh them up, why why would they do that? And going back to sort of Paul's point about choice, um, you know, you want to make sure that they're a really good choice and people recognise that. So, you know, what what what's the thoughts of you and Dave, Dave Pearson on, on how you make sure that people see them as good value that they want to use? I think value is an interesting, well, value and price are very, you know, interesting things you know, to, to discuss in that way. And th that we've, all the stuff that we've just talked about prior to this comes into the value equation. I think when we, when there's plenty of independence, because it isn't just coming from, from our research, but any research we've done, transport folks have done, is price itself is way down the list in terms of why people, you know, stop using the bus or would use it. It's quite what's a way, a way down, but about, you know, right at the top are reliability and punctuality. So it doesn't do what you want, doesn't go where you want it to go to, then that isn't going to be value for money. And that's when you then question uh, the price. I think, I mean, I, I do, 
I think we have um, a number of things to do there. A absolutely. Um, I think we're going to have to, we, well, we are responding to, to more flexible ticketing. You know, the, the, there's a big, there's large value in annual and monthly tickets for those really regular travellers. And obviously the people's travel patterns will change. So we're going to need to, to, to change where that, uh, that, that investment sits. But we have a, um, you know, the, the average adult in Leeds pays around about £1.45 a trip. I mean, it's you know it's one pound fifty in London, and that's subsidised by ATP. So I, you know, I, but the issue with that is how many, you know how many people, you know, want to pay out in advance and make that many trips. So how do we pass the value down to the to the people making you know one or two journeys? But you know, it's a it's a two pound flat per single in Leeds on the on the on the mobile. I I I would argue that is good. Um, you know, is 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 not expensive when you compare it to to, to the alternatives. But again, as I said, that comes back to value and we do need to fix some of the other uh, uh, problems and make that package uh, stack up. You know, the bus you know, being there when you want it, uh, short journey time, shorter journey times as possible. Um, and, and as I said, aligned to, to helping people get the best price. You're quite right. We've got a number of, as a company, we've got a number of trials around tapping. You know, tapping allows you to uh, you know, board quickly. So there's some savings there in, in journey time, reduce cash handling, which again, there are some savings that can be passed on. Uh, but what it does for the customer is it means that they can be capped out at, uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the best uh, value fare, whether that be a, a day or a week, depending on how many times that they, uh, they use it. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're well down the line in a number of areas tri trialing that, and that will, you know, we want to bring that to uh, to Leeds and West Yorkshire as soon as possible. Okay, C Councillor Groves. I mean, thanks, Martin. That's really helpful. I mean, Councillor Groves. I know that this is a a matter that's you know very dear to your heart. We, we you know we want to make sure that bus services are not just running, but they're actually there and affordable for people to use. And affordability will range, you know, um, depending on you know uh, you know your family and your your ha your home. Oh. Uh, how, how, how do we address this? Um, in, in, it, it's a fine balancing act, but really affordability is one of the things that I think is top of people's list, especially those who have got uh, who serve areas where it's very low car ownership. And just recently, obviously, people have been on furlough with a reduced income, so it's, we're under more pressure uh, to do it. But I think in terms of the Ticketing and understanding the ticketing, I think it's quite clear when you get on a park and ride what you're going to pay and what your journey time is going to be and there's always a bus there and that's a really successful model. For me it's about how do we attract new markets as well and make it um, a, a, a service that can, be de can deliver on fares. We launched the My Day ticket last, um, last year and basically for young people, they wanted a ticket that they could understand, that they could travel across West Yorkshire at a set price. There was a 31% increase in, in, in that young, of young people using that service because it was the right price and it was one ticket. We're going even further with that where we're going to have a 60p single journey for young people because we've got to get people's behaviour change starting at an early age. Um, so we're working on all of that. Bristol have got a flat fare. They were the only place in the country who had a patronage growth of around 15%. So there's something in that. But I also have looked at the London model. And because they didn't increase their fares, they ended up with a huge deficit and not being able to, they had to, had to shrink their network slightly. So I think there's a big question around the funding model of bus, what part does the bus need to play in, in the country going forward and, and with the climate change? And how will it be funded to make it a service that people can rely on, that it's regular and that it's affordable? So I do think there's something in the fare structures, but we have to make sure that we're taking on a model that we can continue to grow. Um, I think what people are saying that they haven't got buses in Weatherby, they haven't got buses on an evening, they haven't got buses on the morning. And for that model, you've got to have a really good financial understanding of how you can make that work long term. OK, I mean, that's really helpful. Uh, I, 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 we've got so many questions. We, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, one, one of the things I, I really 
you know, want to say is, is in answer to one of the questions, we are going to use all of the contributions to today as part of the consultation. Where it's appropriate or where it's possible, we can provide some feedback and responses to some of the key themes that have been emerging. We're going to, but we're certainly going to use all of the comment and, and, and we, we would welcome more comment through the Connecting Leeds website and consultation, which runs uh, to the end of, end of March. Um, but also, I also want to apologise because we've not spent really any time on, on rail and this is about enhancing public transport, but nearly all of the questions, and not exclusively, but nearly all of the, 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 the questions and some of the tough ones which the panellists like the most um, have been around buses. So I, I want to go round the, the, the panel before we go. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended this session. We've got a huge number of questions uh, and we will capture those, as I say. So thank you for putting those in. Thank you for being challenging. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists for being um, you know, open to those challenging questions and trying to answer them. So, I'm, But I'm going to go around and leave the last points to the panellists. So can you each tell me what your prior, number one priority would be for enhancing public transport in Leeds as part of the Connecting Leeds panel, please. Martin, I'll go to you first. I think we've, I think we've covered it in the, in the work that Simon talked about, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's more um, and quicker. That, that really does unlock all the ability for, 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 for bus companies to start to reinvest in frequency, additional services, earlier services, lower fares. Um, that, that, that's really the key. And I would just um, you know, make the point I think mean, there's been quite a few questions about, you know, commercial companies and um, and, and profits, but uh, I mean, it's quite an easy point of view from a first perspective. I mean, I don't think first have paid a dividend out for, for eight years, so there, there is no money being taken out of the system in profit. It's 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 in being invested back in, um, you know, replacing buses in West Yorkshire and some uh, uh, right now. Uh, but as I said, to, to really turn the dial, it's, uh, it's it's completing these schemes and, and accessing further funding to do to do more. Okay, so priority uh, and, and delivering reliability and, and better quality services. Simon, what's your number one priority? Uh, um, I, I agree with Martin. I'm going to cheat a little bit and actually say it's the full package because I think infrastructure alone, which I talked about, isn't enough to change people's behaviour. I think it's the combination of things that actually influence people's travel choices and they need to have something that's affordable, they need something that's reliable, they need a network that they can understand. And it's only when you put all those things together that actually you get a viable proposition that can offer an attractive alternative to the car. So I think it's all the things we've touched on today because it's actually them enacting in unison that, that actually influences people's uh, choices and behaviour. Okay, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Simon. Thanks for your input as well. Paul? So I'm going to be slightly controversial, but I think there's a, I think there's still a question mark and a question and a debate to be had in the city and maybe wider around have we got the right model of funding? If this is public transport and it give delivers a social good, should we be putting more than that 30% that Dave talked about into the system to give people the services that they need? People don't pay for their bins. Do they pay? Should they pay, should they be paying for for buses? all of that and how much should we put into it so i think there is a debate to have on that about the quality of service that we get how much revenue funding comes from taxation uh, and from national government to help deliver services for people i think i think i just need to qualify what you've said i, I think you, the point you've made, raised is a very important one they do pay for their bins it's in their council tax as far as i'm aware but i might be wrong um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's what. Uh, they yeah. don't pay directly. They don't pay. No, directly. you don't pay the bin driver every time he comes around, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> Dave. Well, I was going to be the grumpy one that brought the financial realities to it, and then and then Paul's beat me to it. But I, I, I but but in a way, I, I think yeah. But first, the immediate priority uh, and is 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 actually to 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 be able to. Uh, to, to bring us out of the impacts that COVID have, has brought, and, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that's that, that that's had a massive impact, and we've, we've we've got a lot of work to to basically get our bus network back up and running to uh, uh, and uh, and viable again. Longer term, I I, I think uh, Paul's right. I think we 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 have to to 
ask ourselves a question in, in terms of, of what's the, the bus network we want and what what uh, as, as taxpayers we, we we want to pay and how do we want to pay for it but i think we also need a bus network and a public transport network that actually works for people um and i think one of the criticisms that can be easily leveled at public transport is that it, it it's actually sort of slightly evolved from a from a 1950s model of of provision uh, that's taken people to into the city center uh, but but doesn't really do much in terms of of the out of town facilities that have, have happened since so we we do need to actually be fairly radical in terms of how do we address a public transport network that meets the places people want to go and I know one or two people have said that in the chat as well uh, and I think we've, we've, we've got to actually be quite um, radical in in, this, in that sense because um, I think we've got a public transport network that gets people in the city centre pretty well from a lot of areas but doesn't do much else and I think we've got to face that. I think I think you made some good points there then I think it follows on from Paul you know we've, we've got to look at how we, we deliver this we haven't talked about trains very much but we haven't talked about taxes and private hire and uber and we haven't talked about other future mobility choices that might be available so the mixture is very complex and it's hard to get that balance right um and, and you know that is one of our biggest challenges and i think you know councillor groves you've been passionate about trying to work out what is the the balanced solution that we we need for Le leeds and, and for west yorkshire and working with, with the with the, the people uh, uh, on the panel to try and achieve that. So, so where, where do you think we should be heading in terms of our priorities? Yeah, I think there's quite a lot there that I could say, but I think um, to summarise, we have to deliver for the people. And that's why I'm pleased that we've got a panel like we have today and that we've got all those Q&As coming in because that is really valuable. I want people of West Yorkshire to have a sense of pride in the transport system. Um, Obviously, the funding model that Paul talked about is really crucial going forward, and it's crucial for two things. It's crucial because we've got to recover the economy, and it's crucial because of people's health and health inequalities and the environment. Um, but for me, if I were to sum it up about the vision, what do I want? I want it to be clean. I want the zero carbon. I want it to be local. I want it to be easy to use, to, to, pla uh, to plan and to pay for. Um, and I want it to be accessible so people can get right across West Yorkshire that they don't need the car and that it's reliable and fast and that we've got a transport system with all the different modes that works for everyone. I think, you know, we've got to have big ambition in Leeds. We've got to have big ambition in West Yorkshire. And we shouldn't apologise for that. We should be really not be passive. We should be optimistic and we should be pushing this agenda forward. And, you know, I'm confident that the team at Wiper and the team at Leeds are actually doing that and it's great to see this sort of energy and everybody focused on the visions in in, in what i have to say is challenging times um but we, we're not giving up on the hopes and ambitions for the people of west yorkshire no i think that's great i think that's a really good way to end it i, I don't think we've we've cracked the funding model i mean we all know everyone in the panel has said you know there are challenges in paying for infrastructure there's challenges in making sure fares are affordable there's a challenge there in, in, you know, making sure we can deliver the levels of service that everyone wants, you know, and we've got to pay for this in some, some form, you know, and there are different ways of doing that and different ways of gathering that the money to do that, um, you know, but we've got to then balance it out with the other things we have to pay for, whether it's healthcare or, or our, our own personal needs in terms of housing and food or, 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 or other things. So, you know, it's a complex model. And I think what you've just said about people working together with passion and energy to try and find the solutions and improve on things is really what the panel has been talking about. And I accept, you know, not everybody, we may not have got it entirely right yet, but I think the, the aim is to, is, is to make it better. So I think you should be congratulated for that. I'd like to thank you all again. I'd like to thank all of the participants. I'm really grateful for all the questions and we will do our best to accommodate those and get them through into the consultation to make sure that they're addressed in the strategy. So thank you and good evening and hope everyone goes safely. Thank you. Thank you.